Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010, the Summer Session 2019. Here's our book, Introduction to World Philosophy, a Multicultural Reader. In this video, we're going over Leibniz in preparation for exam two and also discussion question two. Uh, the exam question is number five, part A. What does Leibniz mean when he accuses Locke? of not recognizing anything potential in us. How is that accusation related to Plato's doctrine of reminiscence from chapter nine of our book? So if you look on page 386, that is where on the right-hand column is where Leibniz talks about potential and potentialities. And he's talking about potential knowledge imprinted in our souls or on our mind. So Locke was an empiricist who says knowledge comes from our five sense organs. If we can see it, touch it, smell it, taste it, or hear it, then that's knowledge. So for Locke, and we did, and I said to skip the Locke reading because you know it's a it's an intensive six week course and we're going to cover his basic philosophy by going over Leibniz anyway so I figured we just stick with the most basic ideas so for Locke knowledge comes from the senses and then reflecting on our sense perceptions those are the two sources of knowledge so Leibniz is responding to Locke and he's saying doesn't the soul have any knowledge imprinted on itself does all knowledge have to come from the outside don't we have any innate ideas, like Plato said, imprinted on the soul? So we're going to go back to what we covered for exam one in chapter nine of the book, Plato's Dialogues, the Phaedo and the Phaedrus, where he talks about the idea of knowledge is remembering. Remembering what? These absolute ideas like beauty and justice and truth. In the Phaedo, he talks about they are the light of the mind. That's the self-illuminating lamp that we were discussing in the video about Nagarjuna and Gangesha. This is, according to Plato, these are the sources of knowledge, the absolute ideas that are imprinted on the soul of each individual. But the individual soul is one with the soul of the universe as a whole, which in the Phaedrus, we discover, is located specifically at the outermost sphere of the universe where the absolute ideas reside and the soul merges with that outermost sphere and perceives truth imprinted on herself so that is uh, the rationalist perspective so there's two main schools in philosophy empiricists who say knowledge comes from sense perceptions and rationalists who say knowledge comes from these absolute ideas imprinted on the soul reason is the ability to relate empirically observable objects back to their absolute source which is the archetype the absolute idea so we have met for, for plato's idea of ideas we know something is a tree because we have the absolute idea of a tree imprinted on our soul and when we see the many facsimiles of the absolute eternal spiritual idea of a perfect tree that makes us remember that absolute idea. That's what reason is. It's taking the empirical sense perceptions and tracing them back to their root in some absolute idea. And then he'll say in the Republic, the dialogue called the Republic, that the, the, all of the ideas come from the absolute idea of the good. That's the source of all other ideas. So getting back to Leibniz here. I'll just read a few selections. It's not that long. It's two and a half pages on page 384. G.W. Leibniz from New Essays Concerning Human Understanding. So in the preface, he says, although the author of the essay says a thousand beautiful things that I applaud, he's talking about John Locke, our systems differ greatly. He has more in common with Aristotle and mine with Plato, though we depart from the doctrines from these two ancient philosophers on many issues. So John Locke, the empiricist, is like Aristotle, and Leibniz, the rationalist, is more like Plato, although there's differences between Locke and Aristotle, as well as between Leibniz and Plato. So continuing, he says, our disagreements are on subjects of some importance. It is a question of knowing whether the soul in itself is empty entirely, like a page on which one has not written anything, tabula rasa, 
that's the Latin term, a term as Aristotle and Locke maintained, and all that is traced there comes only from the senses and experience, or whether the soul contains originally the principles of several concepts and doctrines which external objects only awaken on certain occasions, as I believe along with Plato and even the schoolmen, as well as those who understand the significance of the passage of St. Paul from Romans 2.15 that declares the law of God is written in our hearts. Okay, so... Is our mind like a blank slate upon which nothing has been written originally and then all of our sense perceptions inscribe that knowledge onto that blank tablet, that tabula rasa? Or is our mind already pre-programmed with seeds of knowledge? So I'll continue on the right-hand column on page uh, 384. He says, the, the modern philosophers give them other beautiful names, these absolute ideas, and Jules Scaliger in particular named them Semina Eternitatis. Eternitatis, okay, eternal seeds, living fires or flashes of light, hidden inside us but made visible by the stimulation of the senses as sparks struck on steel. And it is not without reason that we believe that these flashes mark something divine and eternal that appears especially in necessary truths. So we have these eternal seeds of knowledge, like little sparks of knowledge imprinted on our souls, which is what Plato believed, and this is what Leibniz is trying to prove. And so there are a lot of details that can get pretty tedious, and I'll get into some of them, but I want to try to keep uh, the, you know, this, this course is an introductory course, so I'm trying to keep it as more basic as opposed to getting too much into the details, but it's an important point when he mentioned that the uh, sense perceptions awaken these absolute ideas. So going back to the left-hand column on page 384, he says that, um, so, does everything come from sense and experience, or whether the soul contains originally the principles of several concepts and doctrines which external objects only awaken on certain occasions? So, we have these absolute ideas. So, Plato would say, or he did say in the Phaedo, that we approach knowledge most perfectly when we blank out sense perceptions altogether because they tend to distract us and make us seem like we're whirling around. Leibniz, we saw that in the Phaedo, but elsewhere Plato says, yeah, you need, in the Republic, for example, you need to study nature in order to learn about the absolute ideas. And that is what the aspect of Plato's philosophy that Leibniz is talking about here. That it's not that the rationalists say we can't gain knowledge from empirical observations, what they're saying is that our empirical observations aren't putting knowledge into us, but they are awakening the knowledge that's already there. When we see things like mathematical truths, when we add up, you know, here's one pen and here's another pen. Oh, there are two pens. So this empirical observation led me to an eternal truth. Two plus two equals four. That's a... Uh, you know, you had to first do the empirical observation, but then you realize, oh, that's eternally true. So some eternal truths can come from empirical observations. It, in the next part of the book, we're going to go over Immanuel Kant, and then we'll start to get into more of the details of things like synthetic a priori truths, and, and that's, so we'll save that for then. But, um, so for now, I'm just going to read a few selections and then go back to read some selections from Plato. So on the right-hand column of page 384, Leibniz says, this raises another question, whether knowledge of all truths depends on experience. That means, whenever they say experience, it means sense impressions. On induction from particular cases, or if there are some which have another foundation. The other foundation would be not empirical observations. For if some events can be foreseen before any test is made of them, it is manifest that we contribute something of our own. The senses, though necessary for all our current knowledge, are not sufficient to provide them all, since the senses never give anything but instances, particular or individual truths. All the instances that confirm a general truth, however, no matter how numerous they are, are not enough to establish the universal necessity of the same truth, 
because it does not follow that what has happened will always happen in the same way. All right, so I'll start at the second part of his argument there. He's saying we can't gain absolute truth about anything that will happen everywhere in the universe without fail by just observing individual instances of things. For his example is, oh, the Greeks and Romans said a day is 24 hours. Every day, the combination of light and day in that cycle adds up to 24 hours. So therefore, that's an eternal universal truth. Leibniz says, well, not at the North Pole, and not even if you say, okay, well, at the North Pole, it's eternally going to be however many hours of night and day you get there, but these things will never change. And then Leibniz says, well, it could change because the sun could disappear, the earth could disappear. One day, they, they won't exist. So those empirical observations of, oh, every day it's 24 hours, they can't give you any absolute certain truth. So if there ever is any such a thing as absolute certain truth, it cannot possibly come from repeatedly observing things with your sense perceptions. So, well, where do we find things that can be absolutely true, that we gain these truths not just by individual sense perceptions? And then he'll go on to say, the next paragraph on page 385 on the left column, it says, from this it appears that necessary truths such as those found in pure mathematics and in particular, and particularly in arithmetic and in geometry must have principles, the proof of which does not depend on their instances, nor consequently on the testimony of the senses, though without the senses, it would never have occurred to us to think of them. So we have these innate truths and in the eternal laws of reason. For example, we find them in mathematics. We wouldn't come up with the laws of mathematics without sense impressions forcing us to, you know, how, how many sheep do I have over here? Oh, so now this empirical observation of sheep leads to mathematical calculations. But once we do the mathematical calculations, we realize, oh, this is a universal eternal truth that must always be true everywhere in the universe. Whenever you take two th kinds of things, no matter what they are, and add them to two more things, You'll have four things, so that's a mathematical law that must necessarily always hold true everywhere. And if we have such things, that means our souls must be imprinted with this knowledge, or at the very least, this knowledge is not coming from our bodily sense impressions. So the implication is that the knowledge is innate, and that we need to uncover that knowledge, and sense impressions help us to dig up these absolute ideas that are kind of buried under the muck of ignorance and um, that is one of the purposes of science, to uncover these hidden truths. So over on uh, the, uh, this is just an interesting thing here about animals, so it's not necessarily something you'll refer to on the exam, but on the top of the right-hand column on page 385, he's saying, this is how our knowledge differs from that of animals. Animals are purely empirical and do nothing but be ruled by instances. As far as we can judge, they never manage to form necessary propositions. Human beings are capable of deductive sciences. The faculty of reasoning in animals forms consecutions, progressions of thought, of a lower order than those characteristic of human reason. So skipping a little bit, he says, this is why it is so easy for men to catch animals and why it is so easy for a simple empiric to make mistakes. So animals see things in the past and they assume, oh, because it happened in the past, it must always be like that. And they can't get outside of their immediate empirical observations to discover some underlying causative principles that must always hold true everywhere. So that's but humans can we can figure out the laws of gravity and you know oh okay well we'll we'll figure out a way to trap this animal that this in some kind of a scenario that the animal has never experienced before and therefore not ever having direct empirical observation of anything like this won't know what to do put up a box with a stick holding one edge of the box up and then tie a string to the stick and then put some bait under the box when an animal comes to eat the bait you pull the string, the stick goes away, the box falls down, and you trapped the animal. How come the animal couldn't figure out, oh, look at this, this is a trap? Because the animal's never seen a box with a 
stick holding it up and a string attached to it, so it can't reason out what might happen as a result, because it needs to have direct empirical observations for knowledge. Whereas humans, on the other hand, it seems we have these innate truths that awaken in, in when the empirical situation warrants it or instigates this knowledge. And, and so that's what separates us from the animals, he says, which is basically reason. We have reason, which is the ability to relate empirical observations to their eternal innate truths imprinted on the soul. So um, on the left-hand column on 386, on the, near the top, he says, however, reflection is just attention to what is in us, and sensation does not give us what we already carry with us. So Locke said there's two sources of knowledge, sense perceptions, and then reflection on those memories of our sense impressions. And Leibniz is saying it's not just memories of sense impressions that are in our minds, but other forms of knowledge. And, and he, he lists them here. He says, that being the case, can one deny that much is innate in our minds, since we are innate, so to speak, to ourselves, and that there is in us to wit? And then he lists, in a bulleted list, the different absolute ideas that he thinks are imprinted on our souls. Unit, substance, duration, change, action, perception, pleasure. And a thousand other objects of our intellectual ideas. So let me read this as a question. He says, that being the case, can one deny that much is innate in our minds, since we are innate, so to speak, to ourselves, and that there, are, that there is in us to wit, these ideas, unit, substance, duration, change, action, perception, pleasure, and a thousand other objects of our intellectual ideas? You know, why do you reject that we have these objective, real ideas imprinted on our, on our minds? All ideas of the mind aren't subjective interpretations that people come up with after reflecting on sense perceptions, says Leibniz. There are objective truths imprinted on our minds that are true everywhere in the universe, and not only are they imprinted on our minds, but they're imprinted on the minds of everybody. There's these universal truths, archetypes of the collective unconscious, is what the psychologist Carl Jung, following Plato and Leibniz, would call them. So continuing here, he says, These objects being immediate and always present in our understanding, though they can't always be seen because of our distractions and our needs, why be astonished that they say that these ideas are innate in us with all that follows from it? I have also made use of the analogy of a veined slab of marble rather than a smooth marble slab or an empty page, what philosophers call a tabula rasa. For if the soul resembled an empty page, truths would be in us as the figure of Hercules is in a slab of marble when the marble is completely indifferent to receive this or that figure. But if there were veins in the stone which marked the figure of Hercules in preference to other figures, Hercules would be innate there in some fashion, though we would need to work to discover these veins and to clean them by polishing while cutting off what obscures them. Thus, ideas and truths are innate in us, like inclinations, natural dispositions, tendencies, or potentialities, and not like actions, though these potentialities are always accompanied by certain often insensitive mental acts that answer to them. All right, so I covered a lot there, and this is the question about Locke and the idea of potentialities. So Hercules, you want to make a statue of Hercules from a block of marble? Well, if it's a tabula rasa, sure, the shape of Hercules is in that slab of marble. You just have to chisel it away to the exact shape, but you're projecting that shape onto that marble. It's, it's a blank slab. You can make whatever you want out of it. It doesn't prefer this shape or that shape or any shape. But then Leibniz says, well, what if you had a block of marble with certain veins going through it? You know, it, it lends itself to certain shapes. If you try to cut it certain ways, it will shatter. It's, it forces you to choose from a certain limited number of, of shapes. And it could be a peculiarity of the marble that it particularly looks like a statue of Hercules. Well, they say that's kind of like our mind. It has these predispositions in it. It's not blank. It's not completely an empty page. It has its own objects within it, and he calls those inclinations, natural dispositions, tendencies, or potentialities. So this is back up to the right-hand column of 386. 
and not like actions, though these potentialities are always accompanied by certain often insensitive mental acts that answer to them. Continuing, he says, it seems that Locke claims there is nothing potential in us, and even nothing that we do not always realize, but he cannot maintain that rigorously. Otherwise, his views would be too paradoxical. We are not always aware of the dispositions and tendencies we have. Our memories are not always before us. They don't always come to our help when we need them. Even though we often easily call them to mind on some light occasion that makes us remember, just as... All right, so... Potentialities. These are the ideas. These are the absolute ideas on our soul. Locke doesn't believe in that. He's an empiricist. He's not a rationalist. Potential knowledge is what these absolute ideas imprinted on the soul are like. We are potentially aware of everything in the universe because all of the absolute ideas that describe the universe and from which the universe itself emanates, according to Plato, are there in our own soul. So Locke, we saw Locke in the first part of our class, which was uh, starting with part two, we saw Locke say that it's impossible not to know that we are knowing. Whenever we have knowledge, we know that we're knowing. That was part of his definition of a self. And in that video, I said, well, is that true? You could be driving home, thinking about one thing. Before you know it, you've arrived and you've, you don't remember any of the twists and turns because you're on autopilot. Your unconscious mind was, was driving the car while your conscious mind was contemplating whatever it is. So it seemed that Locke didn't have an idea of an unconscious mind that contains these absolute ideas. There's a certain threshold of energy that an idea has to have to rise up from the potential state to the actual state. And it's really the first um, expression of the idea of an unconscious mind in the modern world. And so that, so going to, let me read this question again. So in part a of exam number two, question number five, what does Leibniz mean when he accuses Locke of not recognizing anything potential in us? All right, so that's what he means. He, he means Locke doesn't recognize that we have part of our mind that contains objects of knowledge that aren't yet, we're not yet actively aware of, but they can become aware and they're not in that the awareness doesn't have to come from outside of us through empirical observations, that we have these absolute ideas imprinted on our souls. Um, and even the very idea of memory. Oh, you, you have sense impressions and then you remember them later. Well, where were they stored? Where is memory? Is it If we have a blank slate, it would seem that everything that we learn from empirical observations would be written on that chalkboard of our mind not disappearing and then re-emerging. That's not like a chalkboard. What's responsible for the fact that we remember some things that happened 20 years ago and other times we can't remember what we really need to know? It implies that there's two levels of the mind and that some knowledge is in a potential state. In the unconscious mind is what, what it really is. And that just because we can't easily just, okay, oh, you say I have absolute ideas written on my soul? Well, let me take a look here. I'm looking at it. No, nope, I don't see anything. So Leibniz says, no, it's kind of like the marble. You have to chisel away and work hard and polish. It's not open an open book for us to read easily. It takes work. But that just because it's not easily accessible doesn't mean it isn't there. And so I'll continue to read here on page 386 because now he's going to get into uh, the question concerning um, Plato. So... All right, so Locke limits his thesis in other places by saying that there's nothing in us that we weren't aware of at some earlier time, but nobody can guarantee by reason alone how far our forgotten apperceptions might extend. The Platonic doctrine of reminiscences, uh, the, the Platonic doctrine of reminiscence, fabulous as it is, does not contain anything nakedly incompatible with reason. In addition, say I, why is it necessary that we acquire everything by our perceptions of external things? Why can we unearth nothing in ourselves? Is our soul by itself a vacuum? And then he goes on to say, and, and talking about tabula rasa, have you ever seen a perfectly smooth tablet, a perfectly blank page? You know, there's texture, there's always something there. But 
that's how he concludes this excerpt. But going back to his mention of Plato, he says, but nobody can guarantee by reason alone how far our forgotten apperceptions might extend. The Platonic doctrine of reminiscence, fabulous as it is, does not contain anything nakedly incompatible with reason. So what is the Platonic doctrine of reminiscences? So Plato says, we have certain forms of knowledge that we could never have gotten from sense perceptions. For example, in the Phaedo, in a part that we didn't read, uh, on our, in our book, the Phaedo, the dialogue, the Phaedo, starts on page 251. In that dialogue, he gives proofs for the soul. So he's in prison. He's awaiting the hemlock. He's been sentenced to death for corrupting the youth and believing in gods of his own invention instead of the gods of the state. So his friends, Simeus and Kibi, say, Socrates, why are you so jolly when you're about to die? Aren't you afraid? And he says, no, I'm going to live eternally. Prove it to me. So he has three main proofs. And the most famous one is that knowledge is recollection. And the example he gives there is absolute equality, these absolute forms of knowledge. You've never seen two things in the, in the world that are absolutely equal. You might have two, two pens that are built by the same company or two cars, and they look the same, but on closer inspection, you'll see minor differences. So if we've never had an empirical observation of absolute equality, how is it that Everyone knows what that means, even little children. If you give two little children, you know, two and a half years old, uh, two pieces of cake and one's a little bigger than the other, noticeably, the one who gets the smaller piece is going to say, that's not, those aren't equal. And they're furthermore going to relate that inequality to injustice. They're not equal. And therefore, this is not absolutely just. You're giving the, my sibling a larger piece of cake that indicates injustice. So where did these children ever learn about absolute equality? If you give two dogs two pieces of cake that aren't exactly equal, they're not, the one who gets a little bit less isn't going to complain. It's not going to ignite this knowledge, this memory of the absolute idea of equality and how that's linked to the idea of absolute justice. But humans can do that. We have sense perceptions of, of things and that makes us remember these absolute ideas imprinted on the soul. And Socrates in the Phaedo, when he's getting ready to die, he's saying that we can only perceive these absolute ideas after we die, because our sense perceptions distract us from these pure truths. Uh, if you look on page 252, this is the Phaedo on the right-hand column. He's saying um, that philosophers are always preparing to death. It would be foolish for me as a philosopher to worry about dying now, on the right-hand column, 252, up at the top, he says, And in this the philosopher dishonors the body. His soul runs away from the body and desires to be alone and by herself. That's true. Well, but there's another thing, Simeus. Is there or is there not an absolute justice? Assuredly there is, and an absolute beauty and absolute good, of course. But did you ever behold any of them with your eyes? Certainly not. Or did you ever reach them with any other bodily sense? And I speak not of these alone, but of absolute greatness and health and strength and of the essence or true nature of everything. Have you ever perceived the reality of them through your bodily organs, or rather isn't the nearest approach to the knowledge of their several natures made by one who so orders his intellectual vision as to have the most exact conception of the essence of that which he considers? Certainly, and he attains to the knowledge of them in their highest purity who goes to each of them with the mind alone. He doesn't allow when in the act of thought, the intrusion or introduction of sight or any other sense in the company of reason but with the very light of the mind in her clearness, he penetrates into the very light of truth in each. Okay, so the light of the mind and the light of truth. We're going to see in the Phaedrus that that light of the mind and the light of truth is related to the outermost sphere of the universe, where the absolute ideas exist. Goodness, beauty, justice. As I've explained in previous videos, the idea of absolute justice means... Whenever you see an act of justice or injustice in the material world, you know that it is an act of justice or injustice because it makes you remember the absolute idea of justice with which you're born. You don't learn what justice is. No one implants that knowledge into you. Rather, instruction means helping you remember what's already there. So you don't, your soul isn't a blank slate. It's got absolute programming of universal truths. 
that you need to be trained to control your sense desires in order to see. And really, you can't, as long as you have a body, you'll never perceive them perfectly, that you need to see them not while you're alive. If you look on page 253, the left-hand column, um, in, the, in the middle of the paragraph, or middle of the column, he says, all experience shows that if we want pure knowledge of anything, we must get rid of the body. The soul in herself must behold all things in themselves. Then I suppose we'll attain what we desire and what we say we love, wisdom. Not while, we'll, not while we live, but after death. For if the soul cannot have pure knowledge while in company with the body, one of two things seems to follow. Either knowledge is not to be attained at all, which we saw Nagarjuna say in the previous video, or if at all, after death. For then and not till then, the soul will be in herself alone and without the body. Then we ourselves will know the clear light everywhere, the light of truth. So what is the clear light everywhere? Um, if you look over on page 254, on the right-hand column, the last paragraph, he says, But when returning into herself, this is the soul, she reflects. Then she passes into the realm of purity and eternity and immortality and unchangeableness, which are her kindred, and with them she ever lives. When she is by herself, unhindered, then she ceases from her erring ways, and being in communion with the unchanging is unchanging. And this state of the soul is called wisdom. So yes, she lives forever in bliss. And uh, that's where God will bring my soul, says Socrates at the end of the, at the end of our excerpt from the Phaedo. So now turning to the Phaedrus, this is where we learn that those absolute ideas of the soul are imprinted on the universal soul, which encompasses the universe, and that that's where we strive to go after death. So if you look on page 257, the left-hand column, the bottom paragraph. I'll endeavor to explain to you how the mortal differs from the immortal creature. The soul in her totality has the care of inanimate being everywhere and traverses the whole heaven, appearing in diverse forms. When perfect and fully winged, she soars upward and orders the whole world. So the soul merges with the whole heaven of the universe. And when you die, the, the image was the your soul's like a chariot with two horses with wings. One horse is your bodily appetites. The other horse is your passion and the driver's the intellect. And if you can direct your soul to the topmost vault of heaven, you can perceive the absolute ideas. So if you, and the demigods can go there easily and some humans with great toil are capable of doing it. Uh, so in the right-hand column on 257, he says, but when they go up, uh, but when they go to banquet and festival, this is the demigods, then they move up the steep to the top of the vault of heaven. The chariots of the gods in even poise, obeying the rain, glide rapidly. Everyone else is the greatest hour of conflict for the soul. Uh, for the immortals, when they are at the end of their course, go forth and stand upon the outside of heaven. The revolution of the spheres carries them around, and they behold the things beyond. So... There abides the very being with which true knowledge is concerned, the colorless, formless, intangible essence, visible only to the mind, the pilot of the soul. That's where you see knowledge absolute, in existence absolute, and all of the true existences, like beauty and truth and justice, they're all out there. So I, I went into that, um, and if you look on page 258, the right-hand column near the bottom, so, but the soul which has never seen the truth will not pass into the human form. So after you see the, after you see the absolute forms in the outermost boundary of the universe, then you have to be reborn again as a human if you've seen those absolute forms. If you haven't, then you become an animal. So for a man must have intelligence of universals. Those are the, another word for absolute ideas is universals because they're true everywhere in the universe. And be able to proceed from the many particulars of sense to one conception of reason. This is the recollection of those things which our soul once saw while following God. When regardless of what we now call being, she raised her head up towards the true being, and therefore the mind of the philosopher alone has wings. This is just, for he is always, according to the measure of his abilities, clinging in recollection to those things in which God abides. In beholding them, he is what he is. When God perceives the absolute ideas of his own mind, that's what makes God God. 
And he who employs aright these memories is ever being initiated into perfect mysteries and alone becomes truly perfect. So, and he's saying, but the vulgar people call that kind of a person a madman. So the absolute ideas that are imprinted on the soul are specifically, according to Plato, imprinted on the soul of the universe, which creates the material universe we perceive. To me, this is especially interesting in light of holographic string theory, which Leonard Susskind used to defeat Stephen Hawking in the Black Hole War. And as I've discussed previously, the cutting edge of academic cosmology today says that the entire three-dimensional volume of the universe is recorded at every point of the encompassing sphere, the cosmic horizon, where space-time is expanding from our perspective on Earth at the speed of light. So space and time stop there, and then the illusion of three-dimensional objects enduring through time is shines in from that outermost sphere on the cosmic microwave background radiation. The echo of the Big Bang on these fundamental threads. Plato talks about those fundamental threads at the end of the Republic, and uh, the Upanishads mention them. So it's just interesting that modern academic cosmology, which began with Plato, Plato's Academy, is coming full circle back to Plato's idea of the absolute ideas imprinted on the outermost sphere of the universe. All right, so just to Going back to this question here, uh, part A of exam two, question number five, what does Leibniz mean when he accuses Locke of not recognizing anything potential in us? How is that accusation related to Plato's doctrine of reminiscence from chapter nine of our book? So Locke does not recognize these ideas imprinted on the mind that are not readily accessible to um, you know, for Locke, if you're conscious of anything, you're conscious of being aware of it. There's no unconscious mind. There's no potential forms of knowledge embedded in the soul waiting to be activated. All knowledge comes from sense perceptions and, and that's it. So it's not, um, he doesn't believe, he specifically rejects the rationalist theory of absolute ideas imprinted on the soul. So that is what the, and that's why Leibniz accuses Locke of not recognizing anything potential in us. And how's that accusation related to Plato's doctrine of reminiscences? So for Plato, we all have potential knowledge of everything in the universe because we've seen all the absolute ideas or the absolute forms of knowledge from which the universe radiates, specifically in the outermost vault of heaven in between lives. So that will cover question number five.